Hello, BookTube. Well, it's time for another bookshelf tour. This is bookshelf number two of the small east wall bookcase. Uh, I, after the last video, I did indeed get some grief <laughs> from from my muscular teenagers who said, "Dude, you're not going to risk your life for your lame ass BookTube friends, are you?" <laughs> I had to point out, I'm simply one step up on a step ladder. I'm not actually risking my life. <laughs> But I still need to do it, because otherwise I'd be reaching out of the camera. So, so we're in the second bookshelf now, and we're going to do the transverse books first. There are two of them. The first one is an old one, uh, the type of thing I'm sure you'll get used to seeing in this room. This is Obiter Dicta by Augustine Barrels. This is uh, just a, <clears throat> a collection of literary essays of his from uh, 1887. Uh, he did this is an essay on Milton, on Pope, on Johnson, on Burke. This is... Uh, what I do. This is paid stuff. He sold those essays one by one, piecemeal, everywhere, and then got permission to collect them into a book, which I've often thought of doing myself. I've often thought of doing a collection of all of my uh, long-form criticism for The National in Abu Dhabi, because no one ever sees it. Who's going to see it? <laughs> uh, and, it and some of that is good work. I, 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 I've liked quite a bit of what I wrote for them over the last six or seven years. And I thought, I've often thought of collecting them and self-publishing them under a as a book of my own called the news from Abu Dhabi. I, I, uh, it would be something like this. I don't think I could interest a publisher in such a thing, <laughs> especially for, you know, a hundred books that are long gone. Uh, but he also has some general purpose essays that he threw in here. Like uh, there's one called the office of literature that is, that is quite good. Uh, and then the other transverse one is a kid's graphic novel of Dracula. <laughs> There's poor Jonathan Harker on the cover there, and, and Van Helsing, uh, and we have uh, we have Dracula as well. This is uh, <laughs> I love the style. <laughs> yeah, I love the style of this thing, and it's also remarkably faithful to the original. I saw it in the kids department of a Barnes and Noble when I wasn't looking for it and just had to have it. I'm a big fan of Dracula. I'm a big fan of illustrated versions of Dracula as well. Uh, that was one of, the, one of the more charming ones. Uh, and then, let's see here, which direction will we start in? Uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll go left to right this time. This is the Oxford Book of Detective Stories. Uh, this is edited by Patricia Craig, who's no slouch at detective stories herself. And it has the the uh, French flaps, and it's just just a wonderful collection. I, I, I don't have a, as pronounced a sweet tooth for detective stories as some people I've known in my life. Uh, uh but when I do, I I prefer big anthologies of short works rather than a whole shelf full of, of novels. Uh, I myself think that, that the short story, maybe I'm just prejudiced by Sherlock Holmes, but I, I think the short story works better for, for, for mystery stories than the novel. Uh, it's only a very rare mystery that can actually keep you caring about who done it all the way through 200 pages. Uh, then the next one is The Chillmark Miscellany by Van Wyck Brooks, uh, a name that some of you who know me in real life will know because... Uh, I love vanished literary figures, vanished literary writers, people who had my job a hundred years ago or 50 years ago or 70 years ago. I, they're all gone now. They're not remembered. And I miss them. They're, they are wonderful company to write, to read about books. Uh, and Van Wyck Brooks was, was one of the best of them. Uh, this is a uh, part memoir and part journal and also lots of literary reminiscences. Chillmark is a, uh, a place on uh, Cape Cod. Uh, he had all, all literary people repaired to Cape Cod <laughs> at the time. I don't know they do anymore. I think it's Hollywood now that does. And then, <laughs> speaking of someone who loved murder mysteries, <laughs> this is Popular Government by William Howard Taft. <laughs> this is a reprint from the 1990s of his book called Popular Government. Uh, he wasn't a particularly good writer, <laughs> but this was given to me as a gift, and I cherish it. Uh, his writing is very much the way his thinking was. It moves from case to case, from step to step, with impeccable, slow, ponderous logic. So he's not thrilling to read on the subject of popular government or law the way his adversary, colleague, and then finally friend, Oliver Wendell Holmes, is. Uh, but <laughs> I, can't, I can't have a book room without a taft in it. <laughs> uh, the next one is Tales the Muses Told by Roger Lancelin Green, who was at the turn of the 20th century, a great popularizer of mythology. 
and I love his work. Absolutely love it. The one book I wish I had that I don't have is a hardcover of his called The Heroes of Greece and Troy. Uh, I know that I will find it. I know that it will show up at the Brattle. Uh, but in the meantime, I have almost everything else that he did. He did this, a book on ancient Egyptian mythology, a book on Norse mythology. He did the famous books on Greek mythology. That was his, that was his forte. I think he even did one on uh, Robin Hood. Uh, but this is just, he takes little stories, mostly from Ovid, uh, cleans the peckers and boobies out of them, <laughs> and then, then uh, writes them charmingly as modern-day fables. Uh, takes their teeth out and then writes them again as modern-day fables. And it's just, you wouldn't think I'd like such a thing since the originals are, are the whole source of my existence, but I do. <laughs> and then there's this thing, Gone for the Day. This is by Ned Smith, and it's a, it's a natural history book of just him walking out in nature, him walking out in the woods, and it is beautifully illustrated. Just beautifully, all throughout. There are thousands of illustrations in here. Full page ones, little spot illustrations. There's there's a, a, something on every page, and there, it's just a minute. Oh, oh my God. It shivers down my spine even now. Uh, here, let me get back to that page. There's a, a picture of a uh, full-grown snapper. Let's see if we can show you that. There we go. <laughs> that prehistoric thing is a full-grown snapping turtle. If you've never met one in, in the wild, count yourself lucky. <laughs> uh, Bad-tempered, as all reptiles are. It's no wonder they lost the planet. Uh, but this is just just gorgeous all throughout. Plus, his observations are, are charming in the extreme, so it's not just for the pictures. And then, speaking of pictures, this is a Norton Critical Edition of Vanity Fair. Now, some of you, the last bookshelf tour, I believe, the corner bookshelf, the one behind me, we had a Barnes & Noble Vanity Fair. You might think, how many Vanity Fairs do you need in this room? I think there are five. <laughs> I think there are two Penguins, an Oxford, a Norton, and that Barnes & Noble edition, but I could be wrong. Uh, but this one, I like because it's nice and floppy, and I love, some people bash the onion skin paper of the Norton Criticals. I don't. I rather like it. And this has all of the original illustrations that uh, for when Thackeray was serializing the thing. And uh, it uh, thanks to, because it's a Norton Critical, it also has... The critical essays in the back, and I love that. Uh, it's the, every once in a while, Norton in, in their history, Norton Critical would make a volume that really was the volume to have of the book in question, not just a school companion, but the one you want, the prefer the preferred thing. They did one uh, or a few in this room. There, there's one there. Beowulf is also an example of that. But uh, so we've got the Norton Critical Vanity Fair. How many Vanity Fairs do you need? Who knows? Uh, and then. Uh, a two-volume work. <laughs> this is Tacitus by Sir Ronald Sin. Uh, this, uh, Tacitus was a great Roman historian. Sir Ronald Sin was a great English historian of Rome. And Tacitus was his favorite historian. And in this book, he goes through everything that we know about the book and everything that we know about the stories in it and everything we know about their historical validity and where we know that from. It's an absolutely towering work of classical scholarship uh and also sim is a, a bit of an acquired taste as a reader as a reading experience as a stylist his style is extremely porcupine-ish <laughs> uh but once you like it like for instance if you've read his classic the roman revolution once you learn to like his 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 prose style you can't get enough of it <laughs> it's as as a-hole as, as it is you can't get enough of it and then uh, we go back to murder mysteries <laughs> another great anthology the english country house murders uh, I, I don't remember when this came out, but this is uh, 1989 from the Mysterious Press. Uh, it's just a collection of murder mysteries that take place in English country houses, and I have been in many English country houses in my life, and uh, soaked up the atmosphere of what they are and what they used to be like. Time has been very gentle to some of them. Uh, so you, you can get a sense for why mystery authors would love so much to set a murder mystery in them, because it's corridors and rooms and it feels isolated from the world and the list of suspects sort of suggests itself uh and there's even when there's a murder taking place there's still a very strong element of escapism <laughs> that sounds horrible to say uh but it, this is one of the few books on, in this book bookshelf where i can i can think to where you live to the towns and cities where you live and i can think if you live in america 
you can almost certainly find a copy of this particular anthology, and I bet you'd love it. So I, one of the few cases where I can actually recommend that, and I'm not recommending a two-volume history from Oxford. <laughs> uh, then the authorized version by Robin Lane Fox. This is him just walking through uh, the New Testament uh, and bringing to bear on it all of our archaeological and, and epigraphical information sorting through the, co the contradictions and the, the omissions and whatnot then he's he's a wonderful guide to it all uh so uh i highly recommend it if especially if you're stu if you want to study the new testament if you want to study the roots of christianity read the original yes absolutely but also read this uh, and i also love <laughs> this is he doesn't look like this anymore he's not a young man anymore but that's what he looked like when he was young and full of you-know-what. <laughs> and his author biography, i got to quote it to you, because it's one of the most insufferable author biographies I've ever read. Uh, Robin Lane Fox is a fellow at New College Oxford and a university re reader in ancient history. He is the author of a number of widely praised books. <laughs> really? <laughs> I suspect the author wrote that himself. <laughs> uh, then we have this here. This is uh, Growing Up in Gilded Age Boston. This is Alice Stone Blackwell's uh, diary. She she was a an insufferable prig and a fast walker and a sidewalk hoarder and a bad in bad odor with uh, the Boston Athenaeum for her borrowing uh, misadventures. <laughs> uh, uh, but very opinionated and very readable. And she wrote a diary. She kept a diary when she started when she was a teenager and she lived to be about 300. So she, she lived from the Gilded Age Boston all the way to first contact with the Vulcans. <laughs> so, so, so it's a wonderful document. And uh, the editor, who is this? Uh, Marlene Deal Merrill. Uh, she edits the whole thing, cuts out the dross, adds the critical apparatus. It's exactly what you want someone to do for every really interesting work of literature. I would like it if, if, if someone like her were to go out half the books that I've mentioned and revive them, get a contract for them for a minimal amount of money, annotate them, give an introduction, and put them back in front of the public. I, I'm, it's never going to happen. I don't think this could sell today, but uh, but I, it's... it's uh, she, uh, Alice Donald Blackwell never missed anything. She never missed a single detail of anything she saw, so this her diary is fascinating. Uh, then we have a classic, something I, that I've praised, I'm sure, and that I, I feel certain that I've sent to a lot of you. This is Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. By the great Annie Dillard, uh, her uh, personal and anecdotal natural history that is a classic. It's just an absolute classic. And unlike Gone for the Day or a couple of other natural history books that we'll see uh, in this bookshelf, it was recognized as a classic even the moment that it came out and has since gained such an enormous cult following that Pilgrim at Tinker Creek <laughs> is, is well worth your time to read. And like uh, the English Country House Murders anthology, this will be at your local bookstore. It will be at your library. It, had, it has had an enormous afterlife as a book. So you can almost certainly find a copy. And as usual on this channel, if you can't, let me know and I will find you a copy. That isn't true of probably 80% of the books that we'll see in, this, in the bookshelf tours of this little room. In the bookshelf tours of this little room, but may, maybe not 80, maybe 60, percent of the books that we'll see here i cannot find for you except as a stroke of incredible luck uh, but something like this uh i can so let me know if you want me to uh and then there's this thing perfect example of what i was just talking about i could never find another copy of this not not predictably this is three tales from the sketchbook this is a who did this uh this is a, a it's a lovely who did this Book of the Month Club. Oh, <laughs> Max at Well Done Books. They don't do stuff like this anymore, and they should have a word with them. They don't do original stuff anymore. Uh, this is Three Tales from the Sketchbook, where they take three tales from my beloved Washington Irving's uh, sketchbook and uh, put them in one of the most famous ones. This is Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Winkle, and the Spectre Bridegroom. They put it in one little uh, book and then commission, uh, reprint a lot of the, the original uh, artwork. And to wonderful effect. I mean, I, I don't I don't encourage skipping with Washington Irving. Everything that he wrote, every single word that he wrote was wonderful. Uh, but what a what a lovely volume! 
uh, to have. Uh, and then the last one on this second shelf of the small east wall bookcase <laughs> is uh, A Gathering of Shorebirds. Uh, this is by Henry Marion Hall with illustrations by John Henry Dick. And it is, he, he goes, uh, he's the American woodcock sitting there, grumpy. Uh, there's the, a sandpiper chick. Uh, and that's the sort of thing. It's another one of those old natural history books that I love so much. This is, uh, he goes up the eastern seacoast and just writes the natural history and the anecdotal history of all the birds that live along the water. Uh, those of you who, oh, look at that. This is a wonderful picture of gulls in front of a wave. Uh, those of you who don't live on the, uh, on the seacoast, on the Atlantic seacoast, um, you'll be familiar with seacoasts, of course, but, uh, <laughs> I have a sweet spot for ours. I think it's wonderful. Uh, and it's inspired a lot of writing, a lot of great natural history writing, a lot of which is in this room. We'll encounter more of it. Uh, this is one of my favorites, is just the birds, including uh, the love of the author's life, the host of little, the little tribe of tiny uh, pinball-sized things that run in and out along the incoming surf. They've been doing it for uncounted millennium. They've been doing it when the dinosaurs were here. And yet... They are still afraid of incoming waves, so, so they don't get hit by the waves. They, they just, they run away, and then they run back, and they run away, and then they run back. And every wash of the wave on the shore, uh, when it recedes, brings tiny little worms and things to the surface of the wet sand. And that's what the birds are there for. So, uh, wonderful old natural history. This is from, uh, God, I don't, I'm going to depress myself here, uh, 1960. Oh my. All right, so, and there you go. That is the second bookshelf. So we're, we're two bookshelves down. We have one, two, three, four, five to go. Oh, God. We'll all be old and gray. <laughs> but you asked for it. So, so I'll, we'll see you next time, BookTube. Thank you.